Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Now his parents went up to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went on a day's journey. But they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they could not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the word of the Lord. These verses should always be deeply interesting to the reader of the Bible. They record the only facts which we know about our Lord Jesus Christ during his first 30 years of his life on earth after his infancy. How many things a Christian would like to know about the events of those 30 years and the daily history of the house of Nazareth? But we need not doubt that there is wisdom in the silence of Scripture on the subject. If it had been good for us to know more, more would have been revealed. Let us first draw from the passage a lesson for all married people. We have it in the conduct of Joseph and Mary here described. We are told that they went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. They regularly honored God's appointed ordinances, and they honored them together. The distance from Nazareth to Jerusalem was great. The journey to poor people without any means of conveyance was doubtless troublesome and fatiguing. To leave house and home for some two weeks was no slight expense. But God had given Israel a command, and Joseph and Mary strictly obeyed it. God had appointed an ordinance for their spiritual good, and they regularly kept it. And all that they did concerning the Passover they did together. When they went up to the feast, they always went up side by side. So it ought to be with all Christian husbands and wives. They ought to help one another in spiritual things and to encourage one another in the service of God. Marriage unquestionably is not a sacrament, as the Roman Church vainly asserts, but marriage is a state of life which has the greatest effect on the soul to those who enter into it. It helps them upwards or downwards. It leads them nearer to heaven or nearer to hell. We all depend much on the company we keep. Our characters are insensibly molded by those with whom we pass our time. To none does this apply so much as to married people. Husbands and wives are continually doing good or harm to one another's souls. Let all who are married or think to be married ponder these things well. Let them take example from the conduct of Mary and Joseph and resolve to do likewise. Let them pray together and read the Bible together and go to the house of God together and talk to one another about spiritual matters. Above all, let them beware of throwing obstacles or discouragements in one another's way about means of grace. Blessed are those husbands who say to their wives, as Elkanah did to Hannah, Do all that is in your heart. Happy are those wives who say to their husbands, as Leah and Rachel did to Jacob, Whatever God has said unto you, do. 1 Samuel 1.23 and Genesis 31.16 Let us secondly draw from the passage an example for all young people. We have in the conduct of our Lord Jesus Christ when he was left by himself at Jerusalem at the age of 12 years old. At four days, he was out of sight of Mary and Joseph. For three days they sought him, sorrowing, and not knowing what had befallen him. Who can imagine the anxiety of such a mother at losing such a child? And where did they find him at last? Not idling his time away or getting into mischief, as many boys of 12 years old do, 
not in vain and unprofitable company. They found him in the temple of God, sitting in the midst of Jewish teachers, hearing what they had to say and asking questions about things he wished to be explained. So ought it to be with the young members of Christian families. They ought to be steady and trustworthy behind the backs of their parents as well as before their faces. They ought to seek the company of the wise and prudent and to use every opportunity of getting spiritual knowledge before the cares of life come on them and while their memories are fresh and strong. Let Christian boys and girls ponder these things well and take example from the conduct of Jesus at the age of only 12 years. Let them remember that if they are old enough to do wrong, they are also old enough to do right. And that if they are able to read storybooks and to talk, they are also able to read their Bibles and pray. Let them remember that they are accountable to God, even while they are yet young, and that it is written that God heard the voice of a boy. Genesis 21.17 Happy indeed are those families in which the children seek the Lord early and cost their parents no tears. Happy are those parents who can say of their boys and girls, when absent from them, I can trust my children that they will not willfully run into sin. Let us, in the last place, draw from this passage an example for all true Christians. We have in it the solemn words which our Lord addressed to his mother Mary, when she said to him, Son, why have you troubled us so? Did you not know, was the reply, that I must be about my father's business? A mild reproof was evidently implied in that reply. It was meant to remind his mother that he was no common person and had come into the world to do no common work. It was a hint that she was insensibly forgetting that he had come into the world in no ordinary way and that she could not expect him to be ever dwelling quietly at Nazareth. It was a solemn remembrance that, as God, he had a father in heaven and that this heavenly father's work demanded his first attention. The expression is one that ought to sink down deeply into the hearts of all of Christ's people. It should supply them with a mark at which they should aim in daily life and a test by which they should try their habits in conversation. It should quicken them when they begin to be slothful. It should check them when they feel inclined to go back to the world. Are we about our Father's business? Are we walking in the steps of Christ? Such questions will often prove very humbling and make us ashamed of ourselves. But such questions are eminently useful to our souls. Never is a church in so healthy a condition as when its believing members aim high and strive in all things to be like Christ. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, for those who are married, do we follow the example of Joseph and Mary in stirring one another toward good works? Can our spouse say that they are more godly because of us? For those who are single and desire to be married, is godliness of your spouse, your potential spouse, at the top of the list of qualities you are looking for? Are you tempted to compromise in this area? Second, for any 12-year-olds or any child who listens, do you act in one way when your parents are watching and then do something else when they're not? Do you seek to learn wisdom from your parents and other adults, or do you think that you know better? Do you follow the example of Jesus when he was young? And third, What benefit would we gain if we started asking ourselves and aiming to say in all we do, I must be about my father's business? Would that change anything you've done today or this week?